where we are just hours away from former President Donald Trump's third criminal arraignment in just four months. Tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern, he's expected to appear in person at a federal court in Washington, D.C., where he'll enter a plea to charges that he conspired to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Tonight, law enforcement is preparing, setting up barricades outside the courthouse. Of course, on Tuesday, a grand jury indicted Trump on four separate felony counts, including conspiracy to defraud the United States of America. Today, Trump's lawyer gave another preview of what could be a possible defense that the indictment strikes at the former president's right to free speech. This is the first time that the First Amendment has been criminalized. This indictment is criminalizing conduct, not speech. No, it's criminalizing speech for this reason. What the president saw in the 2020 election was all these irregularities going on. He had every right to comment on that and act politically. In a criminal case, what they would have to show is all of that speech was not entitled to First Amendment production. Well, protection. Of course, reminder, it's not about what Donald Trump said, as Jack Smith laid out in the indictment. It is what he did. Trump's lawyer also objected to the possibility of a trial during the 2024 election cycle and suggested the Justice Department was moving too quickly. The Biden Justice Department has had three years to investigate this. Uh, to take President Trump to trial in 90 days, of course, is absurd. The question is, why do they want to do that? If you want to seek justice, then you need to offer Mr. Pres the President Trump an opportunity to get a hold of all the evidence and understand what the facts are. Meanwhile, The New York Times notes how former Vice President Mike Pence has gone from Trump's right-hand man to potential star witness and now political rival. This afternoon, Pence responded to questions about Trump and the indictment. Anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. And anyone who asks someone else to put themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States again. What the president maintained that day, and frankly has said over and over again over the last two and a half years, is completely false. And, it, and it's contrary to what our Constitution and the laws of this country provide. Sadly, the president was surrounded by a group of crackpot lawyers that kept telling him what his itching ears wanted to hear. Not long after that, the former president posted these outright lies about Mike Pence, writing the following, quote, he didn't fight against election fraud, which we will now be easily able to prove. The VP had power that Mike didn't understand. This, of course, comes after the indictment made it clear Pence did not have that power. And for fact's sake, the Electoral Count Act does not give the vice president the ability to change the outcome of an election. We've said it before. We'll say it again. President, former President Trump's willful ignorance proves nothing. Why don't you think this one will swing his base at all? Because nothing has. If they didn't do it after any of the five million other egregious things he's done, including attempting to stage a coup on live TV, nothing is going to change it. A big legal thing happened yesterday. A big political thing did not. The newest indictment of the former president has a lot of details, but many of them had already been laid out by the January 6th committee. And from a voter perspective, not much has changed. I don't want him representing me. He's, you know, some of his policies were very good, um, but his persona is worse than a five-year-old. He's just ne would never get my vote again, ever. I think that, that he behaves like a child, and, and I don't think he's the right person to lead the country because he, he, his whole life is a mess. I mean, he's been taken up on sexual charges. He's uh, caused riots. In the, I mean, he's, he's just a despicable human being. I don't think he should be held responsible because people are able to make their own, to make their own decisions, and everybody chooses to do that decision all on their own. My personal opinion is that it's unconstitutional, like all of the others um, that have been brought out against him. Uh, for me, it will not affect how I vote. Back with me tonight, former Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio. He is the senior visiting fellow at Third Way and former Republican Congressman Charlie Dent of Pennsylvania. Charlie, since you are the House Republican, I want to start with you. Take politics and policy aside, and let's put a hat on as though you are the head of the Republican Party. 
right? From a practical and logical and probability and statistics perspective, would they not be looking at the position they're in? Would they not think, is it wise to run a guy who's facing three indictments, who's in this much legal jeopardy with multiple trials in, in the year ahead and, and, and still he's the right person to potentially run as their candidate? Does that make sense to you? Well, if the Republican National Committee and the top leadership of the Republican Party were serious about winning the presidency and maintaining and, and winning majorities in the Senate and maintaining the majority in the House, they would clearly not want Donald Trump at the top of the ticket because they know he is simply toxic among independent and swing voters in competitive districts and states. It's as simple as that. Every one of them knows it. Whether or not they say it publicly is another matter. But they all know that Donald Trump cost in the Senate in 2020, caused him to underperform in 2022 in the House races. And so they know he's a disaster. Just look at my state of Pennsylvania, uh, you know, where, you know, all these Trump endorsed candidates, for example, you know, perform so uh, abysmally, not just in Pennsylvania, but in Michigan and Arizona, Herschel Walker in Georgia. I mean, they're, they're, the path is, I mean, it's, it's clear to everyone that Trump is making losing great again. And, and as long as the, the party hmm. continues to simply uh, uh, defend the former president and embrace him, they're empowering him and thereby weakening their ability to win. It's as simple as that. They all know it. But, Tim, aren't they boxed in? Right? They're in a very difficult position. Donald Trump has absolute control over that MAGA base, which you need to win a primary, but it can't go beyond that. In the general, Charlie just laid out the last several elections. Well, when you have a group of people, and I've never seen anything like this in my, my political career, my life, that lacks so much courage. There's very few Charlie Dance, uh, Chris Christie, months and months and years and years later has found a backbone. Um, there's just nobody that has the intestinal fortitude to take him on within the Republican Party at any significant level. And so you get the Kevin McCarthy's of the world who are sycophants, who want to keep their own position. They're more concerned about the portrait and the, uh, you know, outside of the, the halls of Congress or the gavel or the pension or whatever else they're fighting for. They've lost all perspective. And so if you don't have a leader who has the guts to take on their own party or to take on Trump, you're not going to we're not going to pop out of this relying on the Republican Party to do it. And that's why other Americans, independent voters that Charlie mentioned, Democrats, people who haven't participated, need to get in the game and help us take our democracy back. But then, Charlie, isn't the issue, who is that Republican voter? Like, every night I keep asking, why aren't these other Republican primary candidates going after Trump? But the fact is that the current Republican voters are totally unmoved by these indictments. For them, it's going to be Trump or nothing. They're not going to vote for Tim Scott. They're not going to vote for Nikki Haley. They're certainly not going to vote for Mike Pence if they can't have Trump. And, and this, this sort of classic George Bush-flavored Republican, your flavored Republican, the truth is there's not enough of you out there to do anything but have a big old golf outing. Well, you know, if they're, if they're 12 or 13, well, they're, they're 12 or 13, I'm a tennis player, by the way, but they're 12 or 13, uh, they're, they're 12 or 13 Republicans running for the presidency right now, for the Republican nomination. If these men and women all stood up and called out Donald Trump on these indictments, instead of agreeing with him and calling him a victim, and, you know, it's all the deep state and the witch hunt and all that nonsense, you know, they're, they're empowering Trump. The, the Republican voters need to hear a different story, another narrative. All they hear is the Trump narrative, even from people running against Trump. So, you know, you need more. You need Will Hurd and Chris Christie, but you need Mike Pence. You need Nikki Haley and Tim Scott all to stand up and say that Trump is too great a risk for the country and for the party. He must be rejected. There, not enough of them are saying it. If enough people say it, I believe more Republican voters will follow. But they're hearing the Trump uh, narrative. And there's just too much silence. Silence will not defeat Trump. All these candidates are hoping that Trump will somehow miraculously implode, and then they'll be there to pick up the pieces. Well, I don't think that's really going to happen, even though they, they all know he needs to be taken down. 
But are there enough Republican voters, Tim, outside Trump's base? Because even if Trump doesn't get the nomination, even if he implodes, he is never, ever, ever going to say, OK, it's not me, so you guys should go back Chris Christie, go back Ron DeSantis. He hates everybody else's guts if it's not him. And the truth is, at this point, he's running for his life. He's not running for Republican values. He's running to keep himself out of jail. A hundred percent. But like Charlie said, if you don't have Republicans who have been on the team for all these years and supported Trump, if they don't have the courage to say no to him, it's not going to happen. And the risk we have is that if he becomes the nominee, which is why we all have to work together to fight him from even being the nominee, because a lot of Democrats will say, oh, he'd be great, we'll beat him. I don't want that risk of him possibly getting the levers of power again. And that's why everybody needs to come together uh, against this, including Republicans. And you're right, there's not enough. But I will tell you, Steph, in my Senate race in Ohio, we got 400,000 voters plus here in Ohio who voted for the Republican governor, Mike DeWine, and voted for me. There is a number of people, hundreds of thousands, millions in this country, in the middle, who want to stabilize the country, who want better, and and those are the those are the people we need to talk to. And hopefully there'll be enough in the Republican primary. I'm not confident there will be, but I hope there's enough uh, in the country to move us towards better. Charlie, when you look at this, these charges they're not about politics. The charges launched against Donald Trump are about defending democracy, and if Republicans ignore. If they ignore these charges, where does that leave the Republican Party and this country? Well, look, every Republican, I think, virtually every Republican in Congress who witnessed January 6th personally knows that Trump tried to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. He did everything he could to, uh, you know, present false slates of electors in certain key swing states, including Pennsylvania. He did. He, he used his office and attempted to use a Department of Justice to strong arm uh, state election officials in Georgia to change election outcomes. Everybody knows what he did was reprehensible and a, a threat to the constitutional order and the rule of law. It's clear. Everyone knows it. And so really, you're right. This isn't about politics. It's not about right or left. It's about right or wrong. And what the former president did was wrong. And it was uh, disruptive. And obviously, uh, the, the, the prosecutor, uh, Jack Smith, believes what he did was criminal. And, you know, I'm not a lawyer here, but sure looked criminal to me, uh, you know, to you know to, to fail in your duty to defend the Capitol, uh, you know, to disrupt, you know, to try to disenfranchise millions of voters in my state and other states. So, yeah, this is a big problem. And I think Republicans have to own up to this, that we're either going to stand up for these uh, democratic principles, democratic with a small d, or not. The power of our democracy, the power of our economy. Tim, just yesterday, Fitch, the rating agency, downgraded U.S. credit. And one of the factors was what happened on January 6th, was the gridlock, was the chaos created by the GOP, by these falsehoods and the misinformation that's getting pushed. Do people realize this and how fragile things are? And do they care enough? You know, I, I don't think they really understand or know. I mean, we've had this conversation how many times, Steph, people are out there working. They're doing their job. They're raising their kids. They're trying mm -hmm. to make a better life for their family. That's a grind. And unfortunately, in, in 2023 in the United States, for a lot of people, that means you're working 12, 14 hours a day. You're working six or seven days a week. You don't have the luxury you know, 1130 at night to turn on and like catch the like, what like what's going on politically here. But clearly, there's always been a tie to stability in a country's government and their economic growth opportunities. And when you have this level of toxicity, dysfunction, division in the country, it ends up affecting uh, your uh, economic stability. But it's also, you know, huge tax cuts. And me and Charlie may have a conversation about this. But the huge tax cuts that blew a whole hole in, in the deficit after two wars and after the Bush tax cuts, yeah, of course, you know, we're running deficits that are huge. We've got to close those gaps. We can't be afraid to ask the people who can fund themselves to, like, go into outer space and start their own space program personally, like, to pay a little bit more to help us. 
And Democrats need to understand that government is broken and we need a better way of doing things, more effective way, efficient way, not to waste as much money, preventative health care and all the rest. Like these systems are all broken. But when you have a toxic political environment, you don't have a Charlie Dent and a Tim Ryan who were buddies when we were in Congress sitting down trying to figure it out. You have nothing but poison. That's not going to stabilize things. And so, yes, of course, the political environment is going to affect the economic environment. The last thing before we go tonight, turning the camera. I want to remind you, despite all the stories you see on the news and all the videos you see online, the good people in this world far outnumber the bad. The world is filled with people who go quietly about their jobs, the jobs that make the world run smoothly, make this world go round. And tonight, I have a mission for all of us. I want to make sure those people are not invisible. So let's turn the camera to the essential workers, those who make the world run and deserve our thanks. And I'm going to start myself with this garbage collector. His name is Cody. I happen to catch him today. I see him all the time, valiantly doing his job and doing it with a great attitude. Imagine how many people Cody probably sees every day who probably never even notice the crucially important work he does. It doesn't have to be that way. What if we had less Karens and more Cody's? So that is my challenge to you tonight. Keep your eyes and ears open for the people around you who are making the world a better place, who are getting the job done, and they're doing it quietly. I want us to see them get lifted up, and I want to do it together. We need to thank these people whose essential jobs make our worlds go round. So when you post your videos, your pictures online, use the hashtag essentially grateful. Tag us on Twitter, tag us on Instagram, tag us on threads, wherever you go. Here's the mission. We want to showcase more Cody's, less Karen's.